Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining us in this uh, presentation of Signs and Symptoms, or Is I Is or Is I Ain't. At the end of this presentation, I'd like for you to take advantage of the online assessment tool that we've provided, which will give you an opportunity to take a look and see where you might be in all of this, or if you or someone you love may have a problem. Again, thanks again, and we'll move on to the next segment. Anyway, in this segment, we're going to take a look at middle stage symptoms. And I had uh, concluded the last segment on early stage talking about the very last thing we start to see is the person starts to become kind of secretly irritated when people mention their drinking, their drug use, their gambling, whatever their situation may be. Um, with that comes an entry into the middle stage. The middle stage we call the rationalization phase. And basically rationalization is a defense mechanism that everybody uses, it's day-to-day -day problem solving. The problem that we uh, encounter, myself included back before I got sober, was these very common uh, defense mechanisms become excuses and justifications to continue the use. So we kind of take a healthy use of these, twist it into an unhealthy use, and that gives us kind of the blank check to keep doing whatever it is we were doing. So again, we talk about middle stage is that rationalization phase. Rationalization uh, uh, again, like I said, it's an unreasonable reason for doing whatever it is you're doing. If you look at defense mechanisms, I had mentioned also in the last segment, that kind of the big one, the queen mother of all uh, defense mechanisms is denial. And denial comes in a lot of variations and, and that type of thing. The main example we see with denial is just flat out, I don't do it. Um, we don't uh, embellish it. No, there's nothing there other than, no, I don't. Uh, it's not a problem. You've got me confused with somebody else type of thing. And then there's variations. Rationalization is where the person says, well, yeah, I do do it, but here's why. So now we have all these justifications. I'd also mention that one of the things that you'll see as we switch over into middle stage, in the last segment we talked about it's very, very hard to diagnose early stage addiction because very often it mimics um, uh, uh, heavy social use or even casual recreational drinking, that type of thing. It's very easy for the social person to see him or herself in some of these symptoms. Again, the difference is not the occurrence of the situation, it's the, the frequency. It becomes a pattern. So now that we cross into middle stage, again, I always tell patients, very often I'll have somebody that'll say, well, I got everything in the early stage. I got two things in middle stage. I got one thing in late stage. Thank God I'm in the early stage. Well, unfortunately, that's not where the person is. If you see anything in any of these stages, that's where you are. The rest just hasn't caught up yet. I like to look at addiction as a package that we buy. And sooner or later, if we live long enough, if we keep drinking and using and whatever, these things eventually will occur, not a matter of if, but when. So again, it's a progressive illness. Once we cross into this, like I said, if any of this stuff looks familiar from this point on, then it's a problem. It's not an isolated thing. Again, it's not social drinking that went south for a while. It is a problem. Rationalization, again, like I said, is an unreasonable reason for doing whatever it is you're doing. I'm a firm believer that anytime somebody tries to convince somebody they're not doing something they're doing, that's a problem. And you know, we had mentioned earlier, you know, you ask yourself the question, do normal eaters do this? Do normal drinkers do this? Do normal whatever? And I know that's a bad choice of words, but just for the sake of argument, you ask yourself the question, do most folks, when they drink or use or eat or gamble or whatever, do you see this behavior? If the example is or the answer is no, then there's good possibility there's a problem there. To give you an example, and we'll go through these in a minute, I had a guy in one of my education groups a number of years ago, came up to me, first time DWI person, and he really was there as a result of the legal um, intervention. Uh, it created a problem, but it, it wasn't a problem, okay, and we, we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. 
Anyway, he came up after with the list of signs and symptoms we were looking at. And he came up, he said, you know, he said, I know you hear this all the time. But he said, none of this stuff remotely looks like my drinking. But he said, before you say anything, he said, it sure looks like my cigarette smoking. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, this lying about it, the hiding and everything. He said, how normal is it that I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, sneak outside to smoke a cigarette, run back in. He said, sometimes I got my clothes on, sometimes I don't, <laughs> which might be way too much information for him. You know, glad I don't live near him. But, but he said, you know, it's, it is what it is. He said, you know, and I'll brush my teeth real quick, jump back into bed and hope nobody notices. I said, well, geez, why do you do? He said, because I told my wife I quit smoking six months ago. So again, it doesn't have to be alcohol, cocaine, pills. You know, anytime we're trying to convince somebody we're not doing something we're doing, that's not rational behavior. So the very first one we see in middle stage is lying about the use. Most people, if you get caught doing something, um, you know, most people will realize, yeah, you know, they're on to me. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, fess up to it. And, you know, honesty is, you know, the, is uh, the best policy, that kind of thing. I tell patients again all the time, I can't prove this, but I have this theory. If you spend 50% of your effort getting well that most of us spent getting sick, you're going to be fine. Recovery is hard work, but active addiction is even harder. It is so hard living the lie, ducking and weaving. What did I tell her? What did I tell them? You know, what did I promise? And every time the phone rings, you jump and that kind of, you know, lying is the hallmark of the addict. It's what we learn to do best. It becomes a survival skill. Okay? So if a person's lying about their drinking or their use again of whatever kind, then we have to take a look at that situation. I would mentioned in the previous segment that um, all the things that you see in the previous stage will show up in the next stage, except it's increased and, and, and uh, uh, certainly more uh, intense, more frequent. Here's one of those. We had talked about relief drinking starts in early stage. In middle stage, there's an increase in that relief drinking. More and more now is starting to create the need to use. Again, I'd mentioned that one of my definitions of addiction is when the cure for the problem becomes the cause. Now all of a sudden we're seeing more and more of that where it's not an isolated thing, it's not an occasional thing, it's where all of a sudden just things in general start to create the need to use. Okay? I had mentioned in the first segment that one of the ways to look at um, the difference between the stages, early stage is fun, middle stage is fun with problems, with consequences, and then late stage is all consequence. Well, here you're starting to see the consequences are starting to outweigh the good stuff. So we're seeing it sink lower and lower, further and further down the, down the chain. So there's an increase in relief drinking. The next one, and this is one that I think really separates uh, uh, the... Uh, if a person has no idea or still doesn't think he or she has a problem. This one usually is, is one that really uh, uh, cinches it for a lot of people. <clears throat> I would mentioned uh, a while back that uh, some people learn or most people learn in two different ways. Some people learn by reading about something and just looking at a list of signs and symptoms. Some of us need to have kind of a face on the symptom to kind of get an idea of what, what it really looks like. Well, I think this is one where, in my case, I really needed to kind of have a better understanding. When I was doing my evaluation, when I was first going into treatment, my counselor that I was, who was going to be my counselor, but the woman who was doing my evaluation, was going through kind of the typical, you know, uh, uh, you might be an alcoholic if, you know, kind of 20 questions types of things. And we're going through all these, and she gets to one that kind of, kind of floored me for a minute. And she asked me, do you drink so repetitiously? And I said, excuse me? She said, do you drink so repetitiously? 
I said, I, I don't know. I said, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I said, I don't have, what's that? And then she got a little irritated. She says, do you drink, sir, repetitiously? And I said, ma'am, I don't have a clue what that means. She said, do you hide it and sneak it? I said, why didn't you ask me that? Yeah, you know, <laughs> absolutely I do. So somebody reading through going, do you drink so repetition? Well, not damn fine though, you know, no. And then when somebody, you hear it and what the explanation is or see it in somebody's, it takes on a whole different meaning. So the hiding and sneaking, this is kind of a twofold process, okay? <clears throat> not only do you have to lie about what you're doing, because if you've convinced somebody you're not doing something you're doing, you've got to hide it. Okay? You become very, very good at hiding it. Okay? Sometimes not as good as we think we are, but uh, to give you an example, every alcoholic in particular has a decoy bottle. He or she has that one bottle that sits where every, God and everybody can see it. I had one. It was full of gin, and it sat where it could be seen. And every time my wife would say, you've been drinking, I'd point to that bottle, okay? And it was full, okay? Now, I tell not to give away trade secrets, but I was a gin drinker, and gin's the same color as water. (laughs) I am so glad. Maybe she did, and after she hears this, I might hear the real story. I don't know. She opened that up. Gin is very aromatic, so I could have gotten away with it for a while. It's got a really uh, distinct smell. And even if the bottle's empty and you fill it with water, it still smells like gin. It kind of stays forever. If anybody had taken a sip out of it, they certainly would have found out that was the cheapest gin on on the market because it had no kick whatsoever. Well, that, and I use that decoy bottle, and this this is alcoholic thinking. We always think, again, if we could put 50% of the effort into getting well that most of us spent getting sick. I really thought that she's going to believe this. Have you been drinking? No, there's that bottle. It's still full. Like it's the only bottle of gin left in the world. That's it. And as long as that's full, I'm good. Okay? You know. Anytime you're trying to convince somebody you're not doing something you're doing, you're looking at irrational behavior. So not only was I hiding and sneaking it, now you got a whole other problem, especially you know, maybe with cigarettes and some other things. It might not be quite as uh, difficult to, to do this, but now you got to hide the empties of what you're not drinking or doing anymore. So now you really get creative, and I had empties hidden all over the... I always tell people, when we moved to this area, God help whoever moved into the house we had before we moved here. If they ever remodeled that house, it would be like an archaeological dig. I mean, there were bottles under the, under the, the, the crawl space in the, in the, under the house. There were lots of bottles in the uh, shed in the backyard. Because, again, you never know, not that I had a problem, but, you know, it's got to be close. And so I had bottles under the front seat of the car, bottles in my desk drawer at work, bottles in the bushes and in front of the house, bottles in the shed where, you know, go to get the lawnmower, tell my wife, I'm going to mow the, mow the lawn. And I'd go, it would take me an hour to come out of the shed, you know. And she'd say, what? What to us, it wouldn't start, you know, it was kind of, you know. So I had bottles scattered all over the place. So not only are you hiding the fact that you're doing it, you're also hiding the evidence that you did it. It takes a whole lot of effort to come up with the ducking and the weaving. And again, recovery's hard work, but it's nowhere near as hard as playing the game. I've got a lot of other stories that I, I tell sometimes with this. We'll do that in another, another, another time. The next one I wanted to mention is, this is a very strange thing, and it occurs very briefly. There's kind of this little twinge of guilt that hits. It's not enough to really do anything about it, but there's that guilt of, you know, maybe I am, you know, hurting the family. Maybe I shouldn't have spent that paycheck. Maybe I should have done this. Maybe I should. But it's kind of there and then gone. 
One of the things that I hear people all the time, when you know they're kind of struggling with this one, if I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody say, you know what, if it ever gets that bad, I'm going to do something about it. Normally, if somebody says, if it ever gets that bad, it's already that bad. Something in there is, is kind of whispering in your ear saying, you better take a look. The guilt is there, but we can explain it away really quick. And we're going to, for years, and this is a prime example where this comes into play. For years, addiction has been known as the I'll quit tomorrow disease. I know it's a problem, but I got a better offer. Or I know it's a problem. I'll, I always compare it, and maybe you're different than, than me, but I certainly I do this all the time and done it all the time. I have never met anybody that on a Tuesday afternoon says, you know what, I need to go on a diet, and we do it Tuesday afternoon. It's always come Monday, you wait, you know, start a fresh week, or wait till, excuse me, wait till New Year's, wait till... Addiction's always the, I'll quit tomorrow. I know it's a problem, but, okay? So that guilt is there, and it makes the person step back in kind of that aha moment, but it's not enough to really do anything about it. So the person starts thinking about this. I'll never forget uh, years before I got sober. <clears throat> Another example, I'll come back to that in a minute. I can guarantee there's nobody sitting here right now that loves ice cream, loves pizza, loves strawberries, loves whatever, and has no problem whatsoever with it, I guarantee you're not sitting there thinking, well, you know, I love ice cream. I think I need to go home and make a list of what it would be like if I had a problem. Addicts start to do it all the time. Again, I was going to mention, I had a, a situation years ago where I came back from work, and again, I want to let people know I wasn't doing this kind of work. It's a whole other life and, 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 and time. I came back to, to uh, my office after drinking my lunch, which we'll get to that here in, 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 a, in a few minutes. And I remember walking in the door, sitting down in my office, and it wasn't because I didn't have anything to do. I had tons of paperwork to do. There was something inside that says, you know, this might not be normal. You know, you're drinking your lunch every day. You know, you go home and you drink. You know, maybe this might be a problem one day. Not yet, but one day. Took out a piece of legal pad, wrote down all the things that I thought the alcoholic was. And, of course, it was the typical stereotype, the bum in the gutter. You know, the guy that, you know, beats his kids you know, doesn't have a car, done all those negative things, drinks, you know, cheap wine out of a paper bag. And I looked at that list, and I had seven or eight things on it, and I looked at that list, and I thought, hey, God, that's not me. Well, that should have sent a pretty clear signal that I doubt there's anybody in the office next to me making that same list, worrying about whether it might be a problem one day. The thing that should have been the telling thing about that was I looked at that list and said, that's not me. And instead of throwing the list away, I put it in my desk drawer. And every so often, I'd pull that list out and go, well, not everybody that drinks cheap wines an alcoholic. I'm just saving money. Okay? Not everybody that does this is, I got down to everything on that list. Now, I wasn't a physical uh, drunk, but I was an emotional. And I never hit my kids and that kind of, but verbally I chewed them up and spit them out. So I was just as abusive in that situation as physical uh, abuse. The only thing on that list that hadn't occurred was I wasn't sleeping in the park. And I knew that's never going to happen. Well, never's a long time and you better be careful what you, <laughs> what you say. At that point, I took that list and that's when I threw it away. So I had some concern, some guilt, but still wasn't enough to really take a look at it. It's a phase. I'm going through a bad patch. If you had my job, you'd drink to all the usual stuff that people tell themselves, again, to rationalize the, the use. The next one, I'm going to spend a couple minutes with this one because this is one that's very misunderstood. Not only misunderstood in addiction, but I think it's misunderstood in the general public. 
When we talk about blackouts, very often you'll hear people use that term interchangeably with passing out. You'll hear somebody say, well, I had a couple too many and I blacked out. You know, passing out and blacking out are light years apart. Passing out is a state of unconsciousness. Okay? Unconsciousness, the brain sees this situation as a, a, a panic situation. Unconsciousness is the brain's inability to get oxygen out of the bloodstream. And what it starts to do is it starts to shut systems down to protect itself. It's like a circuit breaker. Okay? So unconsciousness is the brain's inability to get oxygen out of your, your bloodstream. Alcohol interferes with your brain being able to get oxygen out of your bloodstream. It interferes with what they call the brain-blood barrier. So you really, it, it really struggles to, at certain levels of intoxication, to get the oxygen uh, that it needs and the person passes out. A blackout, the person is perfectly conscious and they're functioning fine. They have no recollection of functioning. You don't have a whole lot of problem determining who's in a, well, maybe in a blackout, but certainly the difference between the person who's passed out and the person in a blackout. The person who's passed out is sitting in a chair, laying on the floor, laying, they ain't going anywhere. They're not doing anything. In a blackout, again, the person functions fine. They have no recollection of functioning. Everybody whether alcohol is part of their life or, or uh, know somebody that it is, we've all had an example of kind of the mechanism of what a blackout is, is like, okay? Goes by a lot of other names. Suppose you've had a really tough day and you know, the kids are on your nerves and, and, or maybe a bad day at school or work's just piling up. You got a lot of stuff going on. It's finally quitting time, you get in the car, you drive home, and you're so focused on all the junk that's going on that you really aren't aware of what's going on. A couple minutes later, you pull up in front of the house and it's like, oh my God, how did I get here? It's almost like we were on autopilot and we checked to make sure there's no flashing lights behind us and, you know, I must have got home. Did I stop at the stop sign up the street? Well, I guess I did because, you know, I'm here and I'm fine and there's no damage. A blackout is very similar to the brain being on autopilot. And we've got corny names for it. We talk about brain cramps, brain farts, you know, all these kinds of... Basically, the person is functioning, but nothing's imprinting. Okay? To give you an example, we talked earlier in the, the last segment about there's an occasional memory lapse. Memory lapse is different than a blackout. Memory lapse is where, for some reason... The person forgets something that's occurred. But if you, if somebody comes up to you and says, boy, you know, what was wrong with you last night? My God, you made a jerk out of yourself. And you look at them and think, they must be crazy. Then another person comes up and says, good God, what were you thinking last night? And you walk away. Th if a third person comes up and says the same thing, then you start to step back a little bit and go, oh my God, I remember somebody dancing. Oh my God, was that me? It's in there. It's just kind of repressed for whatever reason, but it's there. In a memory lapse, I like to compare it to doing a crossword puzzle. I mean, a, 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 a jigsaw puzzle. Um, take a puzzle. You've got the box. You dump all the pieces out on the table. And the pieces are all jumbled up but they're all there. And if you take them and work on it long enough, you're going to put the whole picture together. Okay? If you're talking about a blackout situation, a blackout situation is where you've got that puzzle, you dump the pieces onto the table, they're all jumbled up, and half of them are missing. You're never, no matter how hard you try, you're never going to be able to get a total picture of what happened because pieces are missing. Now again, you function fine. Everybody knows a story. You hear about it on the news all the time still, read it in the paper. 
Somebody gets in their car, drives up the street to get a pack of cigarettes and a loaf of bread, and three days later they're in Cleveland, and they got no idea how they got there. But they drove well enough to get there. Nobody stopped them at the airport. Nobody said, you know, we need to call a care. The person functioned fine. It didn't imprint. So in a blackout, again, the person is, has no recollection of what's going on, but they're functioning. So again, it's like autopilot. I remember a um, number of years ago, um, I had a, a, a group that uh, had a family group. And blackouts were a real kind of bone of contention in family discussions. <coughs> Excuse me, because when the person would say, well, you know, I don't remember saying that to you, or where are you getting this stuff from, immediately, you're lying. You know, or you just didn't want to do it anyway. So there was kind of that, when we would talk about blackouts, very often family members would get upset saying, well, you know, you're just giving him, you know, you're giving him a reason to lie. He's not taking responsibility for not doing... Maybe he never really remembered. I remember you know, promising my daughters one day that we'd go to the zoo the next day. Got up the next morning, they're all ready to go to the zoo, wanting to know why. And it's like, you know, where'd you get that from? I never said I was going to take you to the zoo. So all of a sudden, and this is where you start to see some paranoia creep in. Because now people are telling you promised things, and you tell them I didn't. You Well, yes, you did. Then it becomes, why are they doing this to me? You know, are they jealous? Do they want my job? Do they, you know? So it gets kind of kind of crazy with all this. So again, blackouts are, it's not passing out. It's not unconsciousness. The person functions fine. They have no recollection of, of functioning. In the family group, again, I had this um, uh, woman one time. I'll tell you a little, little quick story here, and then we'll take a look at the last three of these and, uh, and wrap this, this segment up. We were talking about blackouts, and she was really, really wouldn't let go of the fact that they didn't exist. And I did probably one of the dumbest things I've ever done in, in group. And I was fairly new at this. And uh, I made the statement. She said, they don't exist. I said, not only do they exist, I'll prove to you. Give me till next Wednesday when the, the family groups met, Wednesday nights. Give me till next Wednesday and I'll show how they work. And she said, you're on. So we finished group and everybody left. And I'm walking back to my office and I'm thinking, that was the dumbest thing I've ever said. There's two things in addiction in particular that we know occur, but we don't know why. One is the progressive part of the illness. It gets worse over time. When somebody stops drinking or using, and they go back to active use. We don't go back to zero. We don't go back to where we left off. We go to where we would have been had we never stopped. We don't know why that. We just we know it because we see it. We've experienced it, and you know, kind of all all types of examples. The other that we have no idea how it occurs is a blackout. We know it occurs because we have reports of it. We see you know that type of thing. So now I just told this woman, give me a week and I'll prove they do exist and I'll prove how they exist. And I'm thinking, you know, there's a Nobel Prize in there somewhere and I'm going to do it in a week. Well, I go back and sit in my office and I'm thinking for a minute and I thought, you know what? She'll forget by next week. So I'm, I'm, I'm good. So. Well, over the weekend, I had this kind of panic attack of, oh my God, what if she remembers? I got to come up with something. Even if it's wrong, I got to do something, okay? And I came up with this idea, and I thought maybe it'll work, and I'm glad I did, because as soon as we walked into group that Wednesday, you got to prove it? Uh, I'm, I'm going to try, ma'am. Yes, yes, I am. What I did, and this might sound like a really corny um, uh, idea or, or example, but I think it gets the point across. One of my daughters, well, both of my daughters, one of their favorite movies when they were growing up was The Sound of Music. And they used to play this thing until, I mean, the soundtrack was off. I mean, it was, but it didn't matter because they knew all the words and they'd act it out. And that, well, I decided because it was available, we had two tape players. And I thought, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this 
one copy of, of this, of course it was on beta back then, that's how long ago it was, this one movie, and I'm going to record a little piece of a scene, like a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to stop the movie, stop uh, the, the film, keep the blank tape running, so now I'm just getting static and snow and everything, and then kind of fast forward the movie to a part, and then pick up with the taping again. So basically you had a part A, a part B, and a part C. Part A was the beginning, part B was absolutely nothing but static, and then part C was the end of the, the scene. So I get everything set up, and I start the, the little film, and people are looking at me like, Is this guy nuts? We're going to talk about blackout, and he's showing sound of music. You know, what, what have we gotten ourselves into here? And I said, no, no, no. I said, you, you'll see. Well, then it came to the part where it was just blank. Okay. People started getting up, and it's like, no, 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 it's okay. You don't have to fix it. It's part of the demonstration. You know, attic math, if one's good, two's better. I didn't need to use five minutes of blank as long as five minutes of my life. I could have used a minute and got the point across. So I'm sitting there going, oh, God, please hurry up. Then finally, the segment comes back in, and there's the end of the scene. And I said, okay, there. And people are looking at me, you know, with their mouths open, like I've got two heads. And I said, now, what I want you to do, I'm going to give everybody a piece of paper, and I want you to fill in the blank. What happened to get from here to here? Take a couple minutes, and when you finish, go take your break, and when you come back, we'll see what you got. <clears throat> People do it, and they take their break, and the whole time I'm thinking, God, I hope there's nobody in here whose favorite movie sound of music, and they know exactly what happened, you know, or I just happened to watch it this morning, oh my God, you know. So people come back in, and they're still looking at me like, what does this have to do with a blackout and family group and, and alcoholism? And I said, now what I want you to do, I want everybody to go around the room and read what you wrote. And I'm just holding my breath. Please don't let anybody get this right. And we're going around the room, and people are coming up with all these scenarios and stories, and some of them were even better than what happened. You know? And so they all fit. Not one of them, anybody went, how did you come up with that? How did you? Every one of them could have occurred to get from here to here. We get around to the very end, and the last person read her little, little blurb, and I said, that was wonderful stuff. Not one of you was right, but what you came up with fit. And just to show them, just to prove it, I played the little segment that I had taken out so they knew that I wasn't just, just telling them that story. I said, that's what happens in a blackout when the addict is trying to fill in the blanks. He or she will plug in what seems to fit, whether it's right or not. You know, when the person is functioning and has no recollection of what they did, it's very, Father Martin again used to talk about that blackouts were a key part of this. If social drinkers ever had a blackout, it would scare them to death and they'd never pick up another drink. Alcoholics start to live that way. In fact, I'm prime and proof of that. I crammed a lot of drinking into a very short period of time. But the last couple years of my drinking was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when I tell my story at a meeting or, or as an example or wherever, I tell people, I can tell you about the first 14 years of my drinking. That 15th year, your guess is as good as mine. There are so many holes in, in that story. And the only holes that have been filled in have been by family members and people that were there. And I know at this point, if they said, well, that's what happened, they've got no reason to lie. When they told me that back then, it was all a lie. It was all, what are you, why are you trying to make me look bad? I know now that what they said that filled that, that gap was absolutely the truth. So a blackout, and this is one of those things too where we look at it, this comes pretty early in the process. And again, they get worse and worse and worse and lengthier over time and that type of thing. The next one I wanted to mention for a couple minutes, again, goes back to the old joke about somebody saying, did you drink your lunch again? Well, for a lot of people, it gets to that point. Alcohol has a dual personality. Alcohol is a depressant, it's a drug, but it's also a food. 
and it's a very rapid burn, high energy carbohydrate. Okay? A couple things happen. There's three reasons that we see, uh, or three occasions that we see of why food gets neglected. First thing that happens, again, is alcohol is a food. It fools the brain into thinking it's been fed. The brain works off of two energy sources, oxygen and something called glycogen. And glycogen is basically what the liver converts the sugar, the carbohydrates that we eat into. So those two energy sources are very important. Well, if a person you know, is drinking, the brain's gotten its, its, its glycogen, it just got it in a different form, so it thinks it's been fed. Also, alcohol is a depressant, so it starts to turn down the portion of the brain that controls appetite, and the person's appetite starts to kind of wane a little bit. Okay? So we see that initially. Again, like I said, all these symptoms might show up in a separate stage, <clears throat> pardon me, but they certainly make their appearance again in each of the other stages, more intensity, more frequent, that type of thing. So now what we have when a person neglects food, now it goes from a situation where the person's not drinking because they feel like they've been fed and that type of thing. Now we get to a point where the person looks at you know, that meal, maybe steak and baked potato, maybe you know, fish, maybe crabs, maybe whatever it might be, something that really you like and is good. And the brain looks at that and says, you know what, that looks really good, but you know what? That's gonna take up the room in your stomach that a couple of drinks are gonna fill. I'll pass, <laughs> okay? So now the person is not eating because it's gonna take up valuable space, okay? The third reason, and this is where it starts to show itself in late stage, the person physically has a problem keeping food down. And if I, if I can't keep it down, I'm going to neglect it. So I suffered for probably the last year of my drinking from something that's called alcoholic gastritis. And basically that's the stomach lining of, or the lining of your stomach is very red and raw and inflamed. It's not an ulcer, but it's just, it's like you're on fire. And of course in addict thinking, when I do this and I get this, if I want this to stop, I'll do more of this. So you pour more gas on the fire and wonder why the fire got bigger, okay? We'll talk about that in late stage when we talk about rational thinking and, and that type of thing. So here, now we have a, a, a situation where every time I would eat, I'd throw it right back up again. And if that wasn't bad enough, not only whatever I ate I would throw up, whatever I drank I would throw up. And instead of looking saying, you know what's wrong with this picture, I'd look and say, what a waste of booze. I gotta figure out a way around this, okay? <laughs> You spend 50% of the effort getting well that most of us spent getting sick, okay? I hate it when people in society in general talk about, you know, addicts in general. We're stupid people. We're no good. We're smart. We're very creative people, you know? It's just the creativity kind of goes the wrong, <laughs> wrong direction for a while. If we can pull that back in and put it in a positive way, you know, God knows what, again, the sky's the limit in that, that situation. It got so bad, <coughs> first drink, <coughs> pardon me, first drink in the morning, which was always going to be, this is my last drink. I quit. I'm never going to do this again. You couldn't pay me to pick up another one, but I got to go to work and make it look like I'm, I'm making an effort because everybody knows if you don't show up for work, you got a problem. In fact, some of us, we used to call that the Irish flu. So you knew if, if there was a problem there, you know, you knew somebody was out drinking and, and that's why they weren't coming in the next day. Well, you can't have that happen because again, you're trying to convince everybody you're not doing something you're doing. So now you gotta come up with a way around this. Well, I would take that first drink and I'd throw it right back up again. And instead of saying, well, that's stupid. Why don't you just take a look at the drinking? I gotta figure out a way. You ask yourself, do normal drinkers do this? I came up with this plan. And what I came up with was I'd go downstairs in the basement of the house that we had at the time. We had a laundry room with the old cast iron laundry sink. And I had a Flintstones juice glass. 
That was my first shot of the morning, okay? And I would throw that back and I'd throw it right up. So you throw it up in the sink and you're, you're downstairs because you don't want anybody upstairs who's waking up to hear you because you stopped doing what you were doing a long time ago. Okay? So you're still playing the game. I got this bright idea. One morning I go downstairs, I got my juice glass full of gin, and I got my toothbrush in the other hand. And I thought, what do I got to lose? Get ready to take that first sip. And I took my toothbrush and I jammed it down my throat, made myself gag. And when I gagged, I threw the drink down and it stayed. Now, rationalization is an unreasonable reason for doing whatever you're doing. I had that twinge of, wow, this ain't normal, you know. But then I justified that by saying, you know what? I know the lady lives across the streets doing the same thing. I know the guy down. I guarantee you wasn't anybody in the same zip code as me doing that. But that's how I was. So all of a sudden, food becomes a problem because you're not hungry because alcohol is a food. You're not eating because it would take up the space in your stomach that alcohol would fill. And then finally, physically, you can't keep it down. So you stay away from it. Instead of looking at the drinking, I got to figure out a way to not eat, okay? Next to the last one on the list here is the person starts to drink or use alone. This shows itself in a couple of ways too. Okay? And very often, like I said, what you see, early stage, middle stage, late stage, you'll see a version of this and it just intensifies over time. The three main reasons that I've always found that a person starts to drink alone, first is preservation. You've been drinking? Yeah. How many of you had? Just a couple. Okay. I think you've had more than that. Well, if I don't want you, if I'm tired of hearing you complain about how many I've had, easiest way to deal with that, not stop drinking, the easiest way to deal with that is hide. Because if you can't see me, you don't know. Okay? So it's a preservation, out of sight, out of mind. Then you see the drinking alone starts to go into new territory. And this is where you start to see the person say, you know, some of those things that I swore never were going to happen are starting to happen. And I swore to you that if they ever happen, I'll go into treatment, I'll go to meetings, I'll do whatever. Yeah, better not let you see me. So now it gets even more secretive. Anytime I'm trying to convince somebody I'm not doing something I'm doing, that's a problem. And you see it in here too. The last stage of this, the last type of drinking alone or using alone you see, and I certainly got to this point too, I got to the point where I couldn't stand what I was looking at anymore, and I sure didn't want you to see it. And the easiest way to deal with that is hide. Very often you'll see a situation where this isolation starts to occur, and it shows itself in the physical part of hiding the drinking, but there's also an emotional isolation. We start to detach. We're there, but we're not there emotionally. We're not available emotionally. Alcohol or, or whatever our drug of choice or situation is starting to take the front seat. Everything else gets shoved to the back. When we do the last segment of this, you'll see a representation of why that happens and, and how I think it, it kind of plays itself out. The last one that I want to mention in this segment is there is a potential for job loss. Now the reason we look at is possible job loss, usually work is the last place it shows up. I used to tell folks all the time that if your work is being affected, your attendance, your performance, um, you know, getting written up, you know, called on the carpet more and more, if that's starting to happen in your life, the rest of your life is a total wreck. Your emotional health, your spiritual health, your relationship, your finances, maybe your legal health, everything else is swirling around the drain. This is the last place it shows up. And again, I can't prove it, but I have a, I have a theory about why that happens too. One is very simple. Society says the addict of whatever kind is somebody that doesn't have a job. 
I got one, so I can't be one. And then the other is purely economical. No job, no money, no money, no booze. God, I got to hold on to this job. Work is the last place it shows its, it, itself. Okay? Like I said, everything else is, you know, uh, a, a disaster. But work very often is that last bastion that the person just hangs on. In the next segment, what we'll do is we'll take a look at late stage symptoms and I'll talk about uh, um, this stage basically like this stage is called the rationalization phase. Late stage is kind of where responsibilities start to interfere with the drinking and the using. Everything's getting in the way and we have to come up with a way to kind of balance that at first and unfortunately something has to give. There's an old law of physics that two things can't occupy the same space at the same time and most of us, we know what's going to give. So in that next segment, we'll start off with that and also, um, uh, like I mentioned, uh, at the end of uh, each segment, uh, there'll be a uh, kind of a, a questionnaire or uh, uh, is I is or is I ain't? Does this sound like you uh, to help a person uh, uh, do a little self-diagnosis? And uh, with that, we'll uh, take a break and we'll come back in, uh, in uh, a little bit and we'll do the, the last segment. <laughs> 